Hello and welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here and joining us for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. It's great to be with you on another Wednesday afternoon for another exciting edition of our very special program. We gather right here at the museum's YouTube channel to meet interesting people who are doing interesting things out there in the world of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, art, education, and more. And today we've got another great program for you. My name is Chris Smith. I work here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in downtown Raleigh, and I'll be your host for today's program and most Wednesdays. Uh, as always, jump into the chat, whether you're watching on YouTube or the comments on Facebook. Say hi, drop a little waving hands emoji maybe. Let us know that you're here, ready to take in today's program. Maybe learn something new and hear some interesting stories and gain great insight. Of course, today is the first day of the month of March, and for the month of March, we will be celebrating Women's History Month. That's right. So all month long, we'll be hearing from great speakers who are going to be sharing their insights, people who are achieving great things and bringing their stories, insights, and experience to us uh, all month long. So make sure that you mark your calendars every Wednesday at noon. Come and find us right here at the NCMNS YouTube channel to do so. Join us for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Um, now, as the program continues throughout today, I'll remind everybody that use the chat, use the comments to drop questions. The Lunchtime Discovery Series is interactive. So as you leave your questions, we'll take note of them. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll actually field your questions to today's guest speaker. Who happens to be Emily Jarvis? Emily is the director of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences at Greenville and Contentnia Creek, and is the executive director of the Bray Hollow Foundation, which is the uh, funding body for those two museum extension locations. Emily, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to share what's happening out here in Eastern North Carolina. I'm excited to hear from you too. Uh, how are things out there at the Museum of Natural Sciences? Things are going great. And of course, today is a beautiful day, which I think that most of the people that will be on today are probably experiencing the same. Um, but we are really getting excited for the spring season out here. Um, we are coming out of what has been that COVID lull with programs. Um, and we're starting to see some real lively um, and excited bookings and reservations for our upcoming spring field trips, programs, and summer camps. So we're really getting jazzed out here. Oh, that all sounds exciting. Well, I'm interested to learn more about uh, what you've got going on out there in the eastern part of the state. Yeah, absolutely. And so if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and pull up this PowerPoint. That'll kind of help to keep me on track today. Um, I have a tendency to, my brain has a tendency to go in about uh, 20 different directions. <laughs> so hopefully this will keep me in one. Let's see. Am I doing Looks it right? Good. Okay, you guys have been teaching me all sorts of new things. <laughs> um, so I will say I'm going to start from the beginning as to um, our beginning days out here. Um, we were once known only as a time for science before this partnership that we forged uh, with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. We're going to kind of start from the beginning and take everybody through what we do and what we're about. And then um, at the end, I'll kind of move into the partnership and how that came about and where we are now and where we see it going in the future. Sound good to you? Okay, and as you can see, I, I titled this a partnership for the future, um, following the, the posters for this talk, but also put, it's also a time for science at the North Carolina, there's always a time for science at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences at Greenville and Contentnia Creek. So I don't know how many people are aware of our very humble beginnings, um, but a time for science also known as the Bray Hollow Foundation, which is the nonprofit, the entity that currently funds and operates both of these new branches of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Science, was founded by Nancy and John Bray. Um, Nancy was, is a lifelong science educator and teacher. 
Um, she and John both have a love of science. John was the founder of what was Metrics, um, now known as Maine Pharma. Um, here in the East, we've got a big uh, Maine Pharma branch here in Greenville. Um, upon retirement, they decided that they wanted to continue their legacy of um, enhancing science education, education and literacy um, throughout Eastern North Carolina. And with that, um, they began uh, a time for science, a nonprofit in 2009. And they were running, running things um, as a mom pop organization, students um, with a real focus on science projects um, and supporting uh, local kids in their efforts uh, to achieve great things in science. Um, they bought uh, 380 acres of land in Grifton, North Carolina. Um, these were This was land that was flooded uh, during Hurricane Floyd in 1999. It once was a, a neighborhood. The floods came, wiped out the neighborhood. And John and Nancy bought up this land and uh, for the purpose of bringing it back to nature. Um, it has since been placed in a, in, with the NC Coastal Land Trust. So it's under conservancy to preserve um, the natural state of the land. And it is and has been utilized for science education ever since. Um, their motto was always experiencing nature, doing science and having fun. And I am proud to say that we have stayed true to this motto uh, since I was brought on in 2013. Um, that is what we do. We try to get people out in nature. We get them doing science, whether they know it or not. And of course, most importantly, we get them out there to have fun. This is a nice little picture of John and Nancy Bray. I know many of you out there know, know John and Nancy. They're wonderful people. Um, where it all began. Now, this is just a picture of um, the, the opening part of Contenia Creek location. Uh, when you pull into the location, there's not a lot but of uh, anything but fields. Um, but down the road, I always tell people, meet me at the golf ball. <laughs> the golf ball is our planetarium. So the images you see here are our planetarium and its observatory. Um, we have a very hardy astronomy program uh, that we that Brian Baker, our deputy director at Continia Creek, leads. Um, and not only do we have astronomy, but we have this almost 400 acres of land that we use for hiking, kayaking, summer camps, school-based science field trips, public programming, and events. You know, every year we have wonderful events like. Earth Day. We have Creatures of the Night. Uh, every year is a very anticipated program we have out at our Continuum Creek location. Um, and as you can see, we've got lots of ponds and beautiful habitats to teach science and, and get people out experiencing nature. Now, when John and Nancy started, they were serving a few hundred students a year. Um, really with just the two of them and connecting with volunteers locally. Um, just to uh, show the amount of growth that we have had and experienced um, since 2013, uh, when they took a chance on me uh, to, to come in and help expand the reach of the organization. Pre-COVID, we served over 28,000 people a year um, at Contenia Creek and Greenville combined. Most of these, most of these people we're serving are coming via science-based field trips. So we have school buses parked out front uh, nearly every day of the week. Um, and our awesome staff here uh, divides and uh, breaks up these large school groups into smaller groups. And and rotate them through different areas of the nature center um, so they can experience uh, different pieces of the program and also hopefully um, get a chance to paddle around in a kayak or hike the trails. Um, some of the most amazing things, you know, for kids here in Eastern North Carolina, especially the ones that are coming on field trips, 
These are kids, many of whom have never had the opportunity to hike a trail or paddle in a kayak. Um, I always tell the story many years ago, and it was probably it was probably what, what, maybe the first year or two that I was uh, working uh, for this organization. I was with a group hiking through the woods. And on our agenda that day, we had a science program, and then we had a tree ID hike. And then we were going to let these kids get in the kayaks and paddle around for a bit. And they knew what was on the agenda. And I'll never forget this group of fifth graders I was walking with. We, we hiked the trail, and this, this child looked up at me and said, was this hiking or, or kayaking that we're doing right now? And a couple of other kids chimed in and said, yeah, it, what's the kayaking? Is this kayaking? And I was shocked. It was very impactful because I realized at that point that even if these kids are coming from very rural areas in our county, they're not getting that quality outdoor experience that, that many of us take for granted. You know, um, so so it, it's a real it's really interesting. And I love being a part of exposing these kids to new opportunities and experiences that really help to, you know, excite them about science, but also expand their view of the world in general. You know, giving them something outside of school and home um, and to know that there's so much out there to explore and engage in. These are just some pictures of our campers that come to see us every year. We of course partner with lots of folks throughout the community. This is Mr. George Powell. He is an amateur paleontologist that lives here in Greenville. He is incredible. And um, he also volunteers at the Aurora Fossil Museum, but he is gracious enough to uh, do so many programs for us where he brings a lot of his collection and teaches kids all about fossils. And um, we really love Mr. George. You know, our organization um, is able to do what we do because of volunteers like Mr. George. We recently added another um, area of our, another engaging area of our land out at Contentia Creek. We've established the Monarch Meadow, which is a pollinator um, garden essentially where we plant a lot of milkweed and other nectar plants um, and, and are hoping to become a real way station for monarchs in their migration. And I'll tell you, we were very excited. We just established this last spring and oh, it was almost immediate that we had eggs and caterpillars. Although Madeline, I know you're out there. One of my, one of my staff, one of my educators is on right now. She informed me that that is not a monarch caterpillar. So I do want to say I am aware that that is not a monarch caterpillar. <laughs> but um, we, we are hoping to utilize this as a real living laboratory for students and field trips and campers um, to really give them a whole nother area of the land to come and engage with and learn and explore. You'll be seeing more about the Monarch Meadows this spring. Now, now I'm, I'm kind of shifting over to our location in Greenville. And what you'll see here is a picture. This was actually our grand opening in, in September of last year. Um, this was when we opened as the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences at Greenville. Um, it was a grand, grand opening. Um, and a lot of the pictures that you'll see, the um, exhibits um, are a big part of uh, our partnership with the museum. We'll talk more about that as we move through. Um, but of course, this is our indoor location in Greenville. Some snapshots of what we have. We have various exhibit areas, smaller scale uh, discovery, whoops, discovery forest and naturalist center. There are a few more pictures. Oops, okay, can I close this so you can see my face now? Maybe, stop share. Okay, so that's just an idea as to what we're doing here in Pitt County and we're super proud to 
uh, be the home to two branches of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Now, we, we are so excited about this partnership and it actually came about in 2017. Um, the North Carolina Museum put out an RFP, essentially asking nonprofits throughout the state um, you know, to apply for, um, to put in a proposal to, to uh, partner with the museum. Um, from our perspective, this was a great move for us because what it did was really secure the sustainability and the legacy of John and Nancy Bray. Because when it comes down to it, I took on this role uh, with a time for science to, you know, I saw two people with an amazing dream, amazing hearts that wanted to do big things. And we have gone in that direction. And this partnership with the museum only um, solidifies that as we move into the future. Now, there are still a lot of details being worked out with this museum uh, partnership. Um, thus far, though, the awesome uh, benefits of this for us as an organization is having access to so many incredible resources. Um, the images that you saw from inside the Greenville location, um, the exhibits team in Raleigh worked really hard to come in and install these beautiful exhibits and to create this amazing space that was very exciting for our community. You know, people were so excited to get in here. And our visitor numbers have gone up significantly, um, especially right here in Greenville, um, after opening with the name of North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. So, uh, and, and also, you know, here we've got a whole new team of people, great minds, experts, and ability to tap into these things um, as we move forward, as we plan for events and create new programs. Um, so we're very excited about this. I don't know why John and Nancy um, took their chance on me, <laughs> but I'm really glad that they did. Um, it was also, and I like to remind uh, John many times when we've spoken about it, that, that period of time when we were just getting started, you know, it was also me taking a chance on them because, you know, this was a, a small um, wonderful, doing great things organi organization, but there were no employees at the time um, that I, I signed on to do this. Um, but, you know, I will say that I owe all of this growth to the staff because, you know, I think I was telling you, Chris, before we got started, I would normally have my sidekicks here. You know, I don't know everything. I don't, I don't, um, tried to claim that I know everything, but I try and hire people that do. <laughs> I think that we've done a really good job at that. I mean, we have got great staff. Um, there's only three of us full time. Um, and then we have a handful of part-time staff. And then we work with interns and volunteers to keep everything going. Um, but I'm proud to say that as a nonprofit, our staff has been steady and Years and years we have worked together, um, which many times in the nonprofit world, you see a lot of turnover. That's something that I'm really proud that um, we have got very loyal, awesome uh, staff members working with us and seeing this mission through. So I would love to turn it over to you, Chris. And uh, <laughs> I told you I might have problems filling in a lot of time here. <laughs> No, this is this is fabulous. Uh, I mean, I've been at the museum here in downtown Raleigh for a little while now, uh, and was certainly here when uh, when we added the Greenville and Contenia Creek locations to the regional network. Uh, but I haven't had opportunity to visit. In fact, this is the first time that you and I have had chance to meet. Yeah. And so this has been a great primer for me to get to learn a little bit about these locations and the kinds of work that you've got going on. And holy cow, I have to come and visit this nature preserve, yeah. this conservation easement that's set up because it, it looks gorgeous and I want to come find all the birds. Yeah, it is really amazing. And we are kicking off our weekend, weekend adventure program that's funded by Vidant Foundation. 
And kayaking is totally free all the way starting this weekend, all the way through June. So anybody can come out and learn to kayak and get that experience and not have to pay a thing for it. So maybe now's your time. You need to get down there and kayak a little too. And now that sounds lovely. That is one of my favorite things to do. And I, I we'll, we'll talk. Yeah. We'll talk. <laughs> Viewers, I'll remind you, uh, if you've got questions, drop them into the chat on uh, YouTube, the comments on Facebook, wherever you happen to be watching. I'm going to turn to those in just a moment. But Emily, tell me a little bit about uh, that that startup process, about finding uh, the the mission for a time for science, taking the mission and the vision, mm -hmm. and then building on that. Because going from two or three hundred students served, I think you said, to mm -hmm. nearly thirty thousand, mm -hmm. yes, it, in a pretty short amount of time, that's quite impressive to me. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about how you, how you manage that? So, um, you know, first and foremost, it, it was important to sit down with the founders and talk to them about their um, vision for the future. And, you know, the vision was ex really expanding that reach, you know, um, and, mm -hmm. and opening that up. Um, I'll say from a perspective, you know, financial perspective, we were starting uh, a little bit opposite of how a lot of nonprofits start. We were starting with a lot of assets as in the land. And, you know, when I came on the, a year after we built the planetarium and, but we had not much cash, not much actual funding. So it was really, there was a desperate need to um, gain the support of our community to actually start getting regular funding in so that we could do things like hire staff, hire paid staff. Um, we had the planetarium built for two years before we were able to hire an astronomy director who is still with us, by the way, and now our deputy director out at Contemia Creek. Um, but it was laying those foundations first, um, you know, because you are very limited when you don't have an engaging and dynamic staff that can implement these wonderful programs. So, so John and Nancy had wonderful programs, but there's only so much you could do with just a couple of folks. So it was about sure, finding yeah. those folks. Our first hire was Maria McDaniel, who was the deputy director here in Greenville. And she was the education director for years. And we joke all the time about when it was just us um, tag teaming and, and, you know, getting awareness out there within the school systems, you know, so there were, it was funding, funding first, but when you have to create the stories to sell to get that funding. And I hate to say sell, but that's part of what I have to do. I have to Tell the story of the wonderful things we do in order to get adequate funding to continue to do those things. So it was a constant balancing act, hiring the staff, and then creating that storyline, that narrative to be able to seek that sustainable funding. Um, and we have been able to do that. Um, you know, of course, as we grow, there's a constant need to grow that funding base as well. So, um, you know, that that's, that's where we're at, you know, constantly seeking to grow that, that foundation of support so that we can, we, there's so much we can do, but we can't quite do it all just yet. So that's, that's where, that's where we're at. <laughs> and that's why I don't sleep much at night. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, I'm struck by how, uh, having been around environmental educators and, and people doing stuff out in nature and in science communication around the state for a little while now, like that story is playing out and has played out in so many places across the state, mm -hmm. uh, whether they're rural, more rural right. locations, like maybe Greenville or, you know, even sites right here in Raleigh is uh, the, the people and the resources coming together 
to to find opportunities to share these stories that we think are so important for people to get a hold of. Um, you know, not just so that they know the difference between hiking and kayaking, but so they actually get that outdoor nature experience that we know can improve people's well-being and lives. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a it's a balancing act um, for sure between those resources and the and the people and programming. And um, you got to get it just right to be able to move forward and to grow. Um, so that's, that's what we're doing out here. And, um, you know, I have to say, I've been really amazed at the things that my staff in particular has been, that they've been able to accomplish, you know, in the nonprofit world. And even though we've got the name of, of us, of the state museum, we still function as a, as a nonprofit. And there are just so many hats that have to be worn and hence many times a lot of turnover in the nonprofit world, but so many hats and to be able to find those dedicated people that are willing to switch those hats on and off and change them and, you know, not get tired of it. It's pretty incredible. So I feel very lucky. Um, and I wish that I could have them all sitting here. It probably would be way more interesting too. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, but they, I, I really wish they could all be sitting here with me because um, they really are the ones that create the amazing stories uh, for a time for science and the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences here at Greenville and Continue Creek. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Let me toss you some questions from yeah. some of our viewers. Are you ready? Maybe. <laughs> The first one that came in, uh, I know the Greenville site has an interesting history. Can you tell us about the building and how it came to be the Greenville location? Um, yeah, sure. So this was actually, this building was actually a Pew's Tire Service station um, in the 1950s. And um, actually, when we moved into this space, uh, the back part of the museum for those of you that have been here, but the, the newest exhibit area, uh, which is about 2,500 square feet, was a dark, dank, uh, I, I don't, garage. And it still had hooks on the wall with all the tags for the with numbers on them that they would use to, to label tires with cars. And it spawned all of that history dusty and, and preserved in the back. Um, and when we walked in, of course, we were like, oh my gosh, this would be amazing if we could renovate this and use this space for exhibit programming. Um, and that's what we did. But this was a Pew's uh, tire shop um, many, many years ago. Uh, there was another science-based organization in this location for a couple of years. Um, and we ended up coming in and kind of working with them as they um, kind of saw their way out of, um, of this space. And we came in and filled it. Um, and we've been here ever since. Uh, and we're very excited to open the doors as the North Carolina Museum at Greenville in September. I saw some pictures. It looked like a fun party. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, the next question here, they want to know a little bit more about you, Emily. What was your career path like and what advice would you give students interested in a similar career? Well, I graduated from ECU and my degree was in community health education and promotions. And as soon as I graduated, I said, oh, shoot, I should have gone to school for teaching because I actually want to be a teacher. Um so I didn't know, when we say career path, I feel like I ended up here with a stroke of luck. Uh, honestly, had you talked to me 20 years ago, I never would have imagined that I would be doing what I'm doing today. So my number one advice for students is, don't worry about it if you don't know exactly what you want to do. Um, because I certainly, I don't want to say I still don't, but I certainly didn't have this in mind uh, in the beginning when I was just emerging from college. I ended up graduating from college and doing the lateral entry and taught um, here in Pitt County. I started in elementary school and ended up teaching at the middle school level. Um, I loved it, 
but also knew that it wasn't what I wanted to do for the next 20, 30 years of my life. So um, I ended up going back to my public, uh, my community health education roots um, and connected with the March of Dimes where I uh, became the community director here in the East and was able to start up what had been a, an area that completely dropped off the map for the March of Dimes. Um, and I built up the foundation of funding and events. And uh, ultimately that's what connected me with this position. Um, it was a combination of my love of community engagement, but also my love of education and students. I, I saw it as an opportunity to kind of fill all of those things that I love so much. Um, and that's how I ended up here. Okay, really interesting. Very interesting. Because I think so many people might, you know, you're the director of a science museum. Mm -hmm. So like in the mind, that's like a really clear path. Like, you know, a, a science undergraduate degree, science graduate degrees, or... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, research, but for, for a role like yours, it really mm -hmm. takes so much more or, you know, mm -hmm. being in charge of anything like that, <laughs> I would imagine I'm not in charge of very much. So I'm not mm -hmm. really, I don't, that's not my experience, but. Well, this is you know, managing staff and then, mm -hmm. and then right. Like you were saying, being a part of a community and then mm -hmm. a building community like that. Mm -hmm. There's you a know, lot that goes into being a director. Yes. And I'll, I'll say, you know, my specialty in this was building that foundation of support and that sense of community. And I'm not joking when I say I hire uh, people that absolutely know what they're doing when it comes to the science, you know, museum, programming, education piece. Um, because I will never sit up here and say that I am the know all for, you know, all of those elements um, that are a part of what I do on a daily basis. But I surround myself with people that have the, the, the knowledge where I do not. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know that in this situation where a time for science was in the beginning when this, this um, organization was just coming to be that, that a strictly science director, education minded person could have come in and built that foundation of support because that was essentially what had to happen as the springboard to take off and, and do what we're doing now. So that I can take credit for, but the other elements, that's why I hire amazing people. <laughs> that's why you're the leader. Like that sounds like great leadership skills. Okay, uh, next one that I've got for you. Are you offering joint program with the art studio next door? Assuming it's still there. <gasps> Oh, yes, wonderful question. So now I've got to say the Art Lab is a partnership that is part of us, but it's a partnership with Pitt County Arts Council, East Carolina University and Emerge Gallery, um, where we have essentially um, created space where these local artists can work. They have their working studios and they can sell and display their wares. Um, they also engage with the community for First Friday Art Walks, um, and are open beyond the hours that we're open. And then on Saturdays, um, where a community can go walk in and get that art piece. We don't partner with them on programming just yet, although that's part of the plan. Um, we do partner with the Greenville Museum of Art that is about two blocks away. We have a specific program field trip called um, Uptown Steam, and it's where schools can book one of these very specific field trips. The students are brought here in the morning and divided. And half of them do programming at uh, the Greenville Museum of Art. Half of them uh, are here at the museum. And then we switch, we walk them. They have lunch right outside the museum on our beautiful lawn and picnic tables. And it is a great uh, steam field trip. 
So that is with the Greenville Museum of Art, not with the Art Lab, although that will be happening with the Art Lab in the future. Okay, that's exciting. That sounds like fun collaborations going on. Yeah. All right, next question here. Do you have a large base of volunteers to call on? Well, <laughs> so there have been a lot of um, stipulations with volunteers during COVID, which I'm sure everyone can understand. Course, yeah. So um, while we were getting to the point, gosh, with a lot of things, but we were building up to this fantastic, you know, oh, pool of volunteers, part timers, funding, then COVID came and kind of depleted those those pools. So we are in the process of kind of rebuilding those. Um, the volunteers that we do have are fantastic. However, we could always use more and we're constantly trying to replenish that pool of part-timers and volunteers. Um, and we also have interns through ECU that, uh, that we, we do rely on to help us do all the wonderful things we do. Excellent stuff. What would you say are some of the challenges that you're working to overcome right now? Maybe pandemic aside. Pandemic aside, I know that's a hard thing to, to do. We're all in that boat. Yeah, because we're all dealing with that. Um, you know, I think the challenge for us has always been the the being sure that the whole story is getting out to the community. Um, so, you know, historically speaking, most of those um, 28,000 feet, well, not feet, because it would be times two, but, you know, most of, the, most of those visitors are by way of science-based field trips. Um, so unless you are a part of the school system, um, you may not know all of the, the things happening at these locations on a regular basis. Um, so it's really that we're, we're constantly trying to build our on walk-on visitation and the awareness from the community that they can come and they can do fun things and be a part of what's happening um, uh, for our rural location in Contentnia Creek. It's, it's a little bit of a drive. So accessibility to that location for people that aren't um, coming on a school bus um, has been an issue. We've, you know, that we've been very program heavy there, um, but we've got one shuttle bus that seats 14 people. So, you know, making our programs accessible, that's been difficult, is making sure that they're accessible to everybody, no matter their um, their demographic, their socioeconomic status, that people can come out and experience what's happening in Grifton. It's hard because it's, even if you live in Grifton, it's a bit of a drive, you know, you, you can't walk, you can't walk there. You have to, you have to get there on wheels and most likely not on a bike. <laughs> so, you know, it's, that's a tough, that's a tough part is uh, just trying to build that engagement with the general population, the general public. I think uh, folks who are watching this, us here at the museum in downtown, I think we share a lot of the same concerns. Yeah. It, even, you know, yeah, we're in downtown Raleigh. Raleigh is the second biggest city in the state, but also getting the word out that we're here and an open and available resource to everybody mm -hmm. to come take advantage of still something that we all mm -hmm. that we all deal with but it sounds like um sounds like you're making great progress and i'm and uh i'm just a lowly little curator here at our museum but it sounds like you're the right person for the job <laughs> well thanks chris <gasps> it's exciting to hear about what you've got going on all right let's see uh marty says can you tell viewers more about how the public can access the contentia creek location is it just for groups program uh, or programs or trails etc available well so we are open to the public 10 to 2 on saturdays and then during the week by reservation only like groups um that have planned to come out 
Um, we were at one time open sun up to sundown, um, but we, as we've gotten bigger, um, we don't necessarily have the staffing to be able to really monitor, uh, you know, visitors that are just coming anytime during daylight hours. Um, we started feeling a little bit, as we've grown, we started feeling a little bit more, uh, we really need to have, really need to consolidate our walk on hours so that we have staff there that can engage with visitors and make sure that people, you know, know where to go and what they can and can't do. Um, so right now we're open to the public on Saturdays only, um, unless we've got a calendared event. So we do have calendared events that are all on our website and social media. Um, and sometimes those things take place not on Saturday. So starry nights on Friday night. And, um, and then of course, during the summertime, uh, we have in the past opened it up for walk on visitors during the week because we have summer camps. We have summer camps every day. So we've got an abundance of staff there every day. And um, we, we have felt better about um, just op being open for general walk-on um, when we've got a, a high number of staff at, at that location. Does that answer your question, Marty? I hope so. <laughs> I think so. I think that gets at it pretty, pretty <laughs> good. All right. Well, I don't see nothing else has popped up in the chat that I see right now. Uh, and we're getting closer and closer to our wrap-up time as it is. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and say, Emily, I think you're awesome. No, thank you. <laughs> and, and I'm so glad that you could be with us uh, to share about the work that's going on out at Greenville and Contentnia Creek today. Well, thank you so much for having me and please come out and see us. I want to meet more of my fellow uh, museum folks. So if you haven't been right. out to see us, come and see us. Uh, the, the kayaking thing is enticing. I have to say, like, I should come see it anyway. I should come see it anyway. But you throw in the kayaking and I'm, and I'm there. Well, we'll count on seeing you Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday, this, well, okay, maybe we'll see. Oh, wait, I have to work. <laughs> That's the other part of it. Look at us being good museum employees. We got to hear, we're going to be here doing our jobs. All right, folks, thanks for tuning in to this edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Emily, thanks again for being with us today. Uh, everybody, make sure that you're following the North Carolina Museums of Natural Science on all social media platforms. You can find us all on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And of course, check out naturalsciences.org, which is the museum's website, for more information about programs, events, and the regional network of locations like Greenville, Continia Creek, and Whiteville, uh, where you can get just great science stuff all the time going for wherever you happen to be in the state. Uh, I also want to thank the folks with the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education who organize and coordinate the Lunchtime Discovery Series. You can read more about their work and see upcoming programs and events from them at their website, eenorthcarolina.org. And you can follow them on social media as well. They're at North Carolina EE. Until next time, everybody, take care, stay safe, keep your community safe, be engaged out there, and we'll see you again next week. Bye, everybody.